many people put their identity into into the past. Uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, uh, one thing is when we have worked with Native Americans, Aboriginal Australians, where there's really something uh, substantial and stake for them because it can be, you can say, access to land and resources, etc. Yeah. But but where I have where I have got my the, the strongest reaction is is actually in Scandinavia. You can say my home area where we had a part, we study on on the Vikings, which is kind of you know a strong identity for Scandinavians, and we could see that that Vikings are not pure Scandinavians. I mean, you have Vikings that are mixed. You have Vikings that have no Scandinavian ancestry, but still Vikings. So it's a lifestyle rather than a ethnicity. Oh. And I was shocked because I got a death threat. I mean. Right. Wow. Uh, so, so it it shows you uh, that that people put a lot of emphasis on this. Welcome back. We are on today with my guest Eske Villaslev on the Two Old for This Shit podcast. I'm your host Angie Sorensen. So I just want to share something about um, something I've been doing lately, and it's been it's been really really good, and it's actually been quite um, it's helped me feeling lighter at the end of like a, a hectic day, and it's also quite funny uh, now to read back on what it is that I wrote. So it's something that's called the third, I think it's called the 30 day challenge. It's from someone called Alex Banayan. He wrote a book about the, is it called the third door? Um, anyway, I haven't read the book, but I listened to an interview with him one time and he mentioned this exercise. If you want to, I think it's if you want to get clarity. Anyway, it's helped me sort of get a bit insight into myself and it's free to do. It's really simple. Uh, you just have to commit to do it. So basically, um, I would do that. I was doing it like every evening, but do it whenever it suits you. So I'm just going to share with you what it is, okay? So in case this could be useful for you. Every day, you you write down the answer to to these three questions. The first question is, what filled me with enthusiasm today? The second one is, what drained me of my energy today? And the third one is, what did I learn about myself today? And you do this every day for 30 days. Now, I actually skipped some days because sometimes you're just tired, you forget, not in the mood. But it really, like, is really worthwhile. And I actually kept going for longer. And sometimes I would skip, like, because I've been doing it for a few months now, I would skip, like, a week or a month sometimes. So, and I'm going to start again, by the way, because I stopped. And um, what happened was I started to read it because that's what you're supposed to do. After 30 days of answering these questions, you're supposed to, like, take an hour away for yourself, go somewhere and basically read all the entries from a distance, like just, you know, distance yourself from it, then answer the same questions. But instead of like today, like, you know, what filled me with enthusiasm today? What drained me of energy today? What did I learn about myself today? You basically say um, this month. So like what filled me with enthusiasm this month and so on and so forth, right? So I was reading back and honestly, uh, I did not expect like to laugh at myself when I was being like, for example, when I was being stressed at work, you, you know, I've had a bit of a <laughs> journey with my day jobs, right? So I, which I explained last time on the podcast, but uh, yeah. And so those come up in this journal and it's really, really funny. I actually laugh at myself because I literally like, I can see when I read back that when I wrote it down, I was actually hurting right I was I remember those days I actually remember writing it like and how I felt and but the way I write it it actually makes me laugh because it's a little bit like (laughs) it's it's just I'm not maybe I shouldn't be saying too much because I kind of want you to have the your own experience with it but honestly I was laughing out loud because I was like oh my god that's like I, sometimes I'm a bit pathetic, you know what I mean? Like when you when, when like when you read back the stuff, and sometimes it's just on point, but it is kind of funny to read back. Um, 
and you get to see a little bit your patterns and yeah I, I honestly I recommend because I was reading it back today because I had to do it for for something I'm doing at the moment uh because I'm redoing the brand so I had to like figure out what it is I really want and so yeah so basically I thought I'll just share it with you now um, so it's called the 30 days challenge and it's from this guy called Alex Banayan. I'm sure if you Google it, he may have some more information, but that's that you answer those three questions for 29 days on day 30, you read back and then you basically summarize what it is that you saw for that whole month. You could obviously go for longer. I think some people go for a year. I'm going to keep going, uh, because, uh, not only when I was doing it and I remember, I, um, when I was doing it, I remember it made me feel better like it helped me not be so much in my head but I'm also writing it down when I read back it's actually written down like oh this is really helpful <laughs> I'm not as much in my head or going over and over the same thing so yeah I, listen I thought it was really good so I'm gonna keep going there you go so you know what I'm gonna say right you, you already know this I'm going to ask you that if you like this episode, could you like, please like share with a friend, like it or follow, subscribe. It's all free. It's all free to do. You can follow and subscribe to it for free on any of the places you listen to podcasts from. It is really helpful to me when you do it. And if you want to do a five-star rating, even better. And if you want to leave like an amazing review, oh my God, even better. I'm going to love you so much. So yeah, so if uh, basically this is all really, really helpful um, to support me and this podcast. So really, really appreciate it when you do. Thank you so much. So in today's episode, we have Eske Willisloo, who is the rock star of science. Today's episode is a little bit different to the style I normally do. It's a little bit different, but I really, really wanted to include this in, um, in the schedule of uh, this season. Eske's curiosity, his strong focus and his open mind has actually helped rewrite our history books. And the thing with Eske is that his journey is really unusual. He is an adventurer and his life journey is nothing short of extraordinary. So Eske is a world leading, let me see if I can say this in one go, evolutionary geneticist and with him today, we discuss where life comes from, conspiracy theories, and if our DNA is alien technology. And he also goes into uh, the biggest misunderstanding about Darwinism, and he goes in and explains this. So uh, I really, really hope you get to enjoy him. And I just want to quickly clarify two terms that is repeated quite a few times during the episode. And I'm going to explain them super simple. And they are phenotype, and the second one is genotype. So the first one, the phenotype, are observable traits that you can see. So whether you can see them in person. So for example, when you would talk about someone's phenotype, it could be oh, their, the color of their hair, the color of their eyes, the color of their skin, how high they are, and so on and so forth. Well, those are things you can see, but it's also things that you can, for example, see maybe also in the microscope, in the, la in the laboratory, right? And the second one is the geno genotype. So genotype is a genetic code for those expressions. So it is the code behind the color of your eyes. It is the code behind your hair color. Obviously, we don't say code really in uh, genetics, but it's basically just to explain it. So just to recap, genotype is the DNA code, like the formula. And the phenotype is what is the expression of that formula. Okay, so that's basically all you need to know for this. You don't need to go any <laughs> deeper. If you want to know more, you can obviously uh, do some research. But yes, yeah, so that's just to quickly explain these terms when you hear them in the episode. Uh, and another thing before we get into it is that in the episode, I mentioned identity just really briefly. Uh, and I just want to clarify because I didn't go into it details. We didn't really go into too much detail in this episode, but I just want to clarify that identity and being accepted are to me two very different things. And also how I have identified uh, myself has transformed over the years for many reasons. Uh, one of them being that I have settled, um, well, I've settled in London over the last 20 plus years, which is a long time. And 
also I have been away for a very long time from Belgium, which is where I grew up, okay? So, uh, but my identity, you know, has always been a bit torn between various places. Um, but definitely growing up, my mentality was definitely where I lived for the first 18 years, which was, you know, Belgium. So, so yeah, so you, it all makes sense once you get, once you listen to the episode of what I'm referring to, but I just want to like quickly clarify that. And so, okay, are you ready? Without further ado, please help me give a big warm welcome to Eske. Let's begin. Hi, Eske. Hello. A very big, big warm welcome. I'm really, really excited to have you on as a guest. And I know people are used to hear that and they, they know that, you know, I usually say I'm excited when I have a guest on, but um, I have really read a lot of your stuff and I've listened to you on Flu uh, um who the host has been here on the podcast and it was also a very popular episode and so I'm very excited because I have a lot of thoughts about you know and questions about where we come from as human beings you are the world leader when it comes to all things DNA and you've written books you've uh, your research has led to history books being rewritten so you know it's no small thing um and so I really want to talk to you about where we come from, how we even yeah. still here, you know? I mean, to me, that's, that boggles my mind. And so um, before we dive in, Eske, please mm. introduce yourself, what you do and where you live. Yeah. So, yes, I'm Eske Willisliv and I'm a professor here at the University of Cambridge, where I'm uh, based at the moment uh, in ecology and evolution. And uh, then I also... Uh, the professorship at the University of Copenhagen. So uh, you can say my 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 job is uh, to do research within the evolution. Yeah, and um, can I just ask you a little bit just before we start? Like, what is the difference between you, who is, um, from what I understand, you're like an evolutionary geneticist, mm -hmm. and someone else who's a geneticist consultant who, who for example, helped me decipher my results from Twenty Three and Me. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, similarities, but uh, when when we look at at human history uh, using DNA, we we are going much further back in time. First of all, then if you are going and and getting your DNA profile interpreted uh, with some of these companies, um, then the maximum you are going back is about ten generations. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the methods that they're using, uh, that's kind of where we start, I would say. This is the big, the basic methods we are using, and then we're applying all kinds of other stuff uh, in order to go further back into the past. We also generally, normally, we are not so interested in, in the, you can say, the history of a single individual, but more the history of a group of people, right? So... Uh, so I haven't uh, got my own DNA done, for example, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, you know, we are not so uh, normally not so interested in uh, in just what one individual can tell. But it's more like the, the, the you can say a broader picture of of human evolution and, and human history. Actually, can I just quickly ask you on what you just said just now about how mm. you haven't had your own DNA check? Mm. I mean, neither have mm. I. Um, no. Because uh, that's not the part of DNA I'm interested in either. But I like, can I ask you why? Or is okay? Yeah, yeah, you can. I mean, it's because, um, well, of course, I like this kind of, uh, you can say, this kind of work in the sense that it put emphasis on uh, human history and uh, and all this is positive. But it's also used very often as a type of identity. I think, uh, you know, yeah. so you can sit and say, for example, you know, I got some Finnish DNA. Oh, that's that can explain why Uncle Joe, you know, is behaving yeah. in a certain way or whatever. And um, to me, identity is, has nothing to do with your DNA profile. Identity yeah. is something to do with where you were raised, who you believe you are yourself, yeah. and so forth. And therefore, I think that in that sense, uh, these DNA uh, uh, profiles can be a bit misleading. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could be from... Your parents, you know, could be from Rwanda or, or, or Finland or Sweden. And then if you grew up in Greenland, well, guess what? Your identity is most likely. And if, let's say if you never met your parents, right? Exactly. And let's say you were adopted and end up in Greenland, you will be, your identity will most likely be 
as being from Greenland, you know. So, it, it, mm -hmm. Exactly. And I've seen uh, this, you know, uh, or heard about this playing out, for example, with some indigenous groups where, you know, uh, people have been growing up in, in a certain environment, considered themselves belonging to this tribe or And then, you know, when uh, there's these blood quantum or DNA profiles, uh, which is basically, you can say the same thing, just at different levels. Uh, and then, you know, suddenly they're not, uh, you know, part of that community anymore, right? And and I, I, I don't appreciate uh, this. So for me, identity is what you believe you are. It doesn't yeah. matter of your DNA or, or anything else. Yeah. So that's why I haven't really done these tests, right? Because yeah. I'm not very much in favor of, of, of that way of looking at identity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, to me, I guess we're just a human species. And can we just start with that? Because we're such a warfaring exactly you know species like we need you know i don't think we need more divide or more you know no, exactly. differentiation in that sense that oh um I agree. yeah and so also before we go into like all the science and stuff I, because mm. i know you've had a bit of a conventional life and you know mm -hmm. uh you know and, and and if you're listening and if you're interested in um you know go to eska's website and he has books and um mm -hmm. about it but like you've got quite a conventional past and way to where you are today like what got you into this line of work and becoming a professor in world-renowned universities hmm. well uh, it was actually something that came rather late uh, because when i was a kid i wasn't particularly uh, good in school to to say it at least uh, and i wanted to be uh, an adventurer and uh, a trapper and uh, order So I, in my young years, in my teens and my early 20s, I, I did these expeditions in Siberia, northeastern Siberia, where I also lived a season as a, as a trapper, as a hunter. And um, I, I, you know, I always, my mom always told me, you have need to have an education to kind of fell back on. So I, I completed my studies in biology at the University of Copenhagen. But is, I, that, is, that, is that where you grew up, is Denmark? Yeah, it is yeah. Mm -hmm. Denmark. I did uh, grew up in Denmark and also some parts in Sweden, but because my father was an historian, worked there. But but um, you know, uh, I always felt it quite boring, uh, to, to be honest, to go to to school and university in the sense that that uh, what you learn is what other people have done. And when you do experiments, it's it's very much doing what thousands of young people have done before you. So there's no adventures mm -hmm. in in you know doing something that many people have done before. But but in my final project at university, we were allowed to do our own research project, and that was a total game changer for me because uh, this is about designing your own experiment, discovering something that no one else. Uh, had found out before you know total new knowledge mm -hmm. and you are the one doing it i was just sold and and this is what research is about right uh, research is one big amazing adventure and you 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 see it when when you actually are conducting real research but i don't think it's very evident uh, during your studies where you learn about what other people have done it's not for me at least yeah. It wasn't particularly interesting, but but at that point, uh, I uh, knew what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a researcher, and just as slow I've, uh, that I've been uh, through the, my my young years in terms of my studies, just as fast did I make a career in in research when I first knew what I wanted to do, and uh, I became a professor at the age of 33 in Denmark, which was the youngest professor at the time. And uh, some years later, I got this professorship at, at Cambridge, and I love it. Well, that, that it goes to show, isn't it, that learning is not about necessarily about ability. Actually, I don't think it's got anything to do with ability, it's to do with the passion, actually. If you're interested in exactly. it, you're going to immerse yourself. It doesn't matter if it takes you five times longer than someone else, but if you're into it, you're into it. You're going to end up exactly. first, you know, in that line. So, yeah. Yes. That's why school Very is true. so difficult. I wasn't great at school either. <laughs> <laughs> So much yeah, stuff I was not interested in. Yeah. So I want to touch on your legacy also real quick, because obviously your research has led to history books being rewritten. Can you sort of tell us like what is it, like which 
which part exactly has been rewritten because for me it's mm. been so long I went to school I find it really hard mm. to know what's new and what's yeah. you know what I mean yeah yeah well I mean I think we have done uh, we, we have been working uh, most across the world really uh, in our research so so uh, you know we have determined for example how the Arctic was populated there was big debate uh, whether it was uh, one wave of humans getting in there being the ancestors of contemporary Inuit people, we showed it was two different, two different ways. There's been a lot of discussion of who was the first peoples in the Americas, um, and we have shown well the oldest uh, human remains from the Americas are basically the the ancestors of contemporary Native Americans. Some researchers believed it were was Europeans and other groups of people who have been in there uh, first, we, we, we have shown how a, we have contributed to how Europe was populated, for example, you know, the Bronze Age, which was a period of time around 5,000 years ago, starting around 5,000 years ago, was something that didn't had much attention because people didn't believe it. it we contributed very much, and it's actually the, one of the major most major contribution to European genetic makeup and cultural makeup, if you want. Uh, so, and Australia, there was a lot of debate. Um, you know, when when did uh, when did Aboriginal Australian ancestors diversify from other peoples? All that we have done as well, and we have done work. You know, on the extinction of the big ice age megafauna, uh, you know, mammoth and woolly rhinos and all that. And there's been a lot of debate whether it was a human overkill or climate change. We have found strong support for it being climate change. So, you know, a lot of different uh, studies. And uh, we did the first ancient human genome back in 2010. And we did, you know, this environmental DNA, as it's called, retrieving DNA directly of plants and animals from, from uh, old sediments uh, that has been used to rewrite environmental history and i did that back in 2003 and we also looked at you know epidemics we found evidence of the oldest epidemic 3000 years before anybody thought there was epidemics and stuff like that so it's mm -hmm. you know uh, the thing is when you go into the past uh, using uh, dna technology as we've been doing uh, you you find a lot of new stuff and and the reason for it is simply because we knew so little we there's been a lot of stories, of course, of how we thought it was uh, based on uh, more traditional approaches. But these these story, stories was based on very limited evidence. And therefore, you can say the chance of them being wrong, if you want, is very high. And when you then come in with uh, this type of technology, which is based on, you know, natural sciences and statistics and so forth, you have actually, in many cases, a very high chance of finding out, well, what we thought we knew or what something that has been really debated, then you really can, 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 you can say, set the record more straight if you want. Yeah, yeah. You've, you've definitely been, you've definitely been, um, there's, it's funny because there's a lot of things that you mentioned. I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember I've, I've learned about this. I've learned about this. So all of these things, a lot of things that we have learned, that we are learning at school and, and that's being done, mm. those are things that you've contributed on. So you, yeah. you've been doing this for quite quite some time, you know? Yeah, um, and, and I would say mm. a fundamental uh, uh, change, I think, that both my group and other groups working in this area have contributed to. I mean, I learned in, in school, when I went to school, I learned, you know, Eske, you are deriving directly from the Stone Age man in Denmark, right? And it was first in the 1960s, there was Turks coming in, in into Europe uh, for getting work. And that was totally exceptional. You know, it, it, normally we didn't have any uh, human, big human migrations. People had stayed in the same areas for thousands and thousands of years. And all this is wrong, right? So we can see that as far as we go back, people have been moving around. They have mixed with each other. They have separated again, met each other again later, mixed again, et cetera. So, so we, we have shown an enormous mobility. And that means that the world that we know of today in terms of where are different uh, human groups for most parts are extremely young. 
I mean, it's it's just. I mean, if you go what do, to what do you West, mean, what do you mean by ext- extremely young? What extremely you young. I mean, if you go to uh, for for Europe, uh, let's say northwestern Europe, most of the world we know of is more uh, in terms of our ancestry. If you want, is no older than fi- the last five thousand years. And if you go to Western Asia, you know, and Central Asia, the world that we know of. Uh, today, where there's Asians, these uh, people of East Asian ancestry in these areas, well, it only goes back to the medieval times, right? Is it, so, is it so, because before that we were, is it because, bef- so basically how we kind of are today, like looks wise, it's kind of like, it's only like just do, just so young because before that we were all moving, we've been nomadic and then we settled, then we moved, we mixed and then we separate. Is that what you mean? Like, so basically... Yeah. I mean, so you can say, for example, if you if we take Europe, right? Um, I mean, we have all Europeans are made up basically of three major migration events into Europe, right? There's the early hunter gatherers that are coming in, you know, uh, when as the ice retreats from Europe during, after the last uh, uh, ice age. Well, then we have uh, starting around ten thousand years, uh, people. Uh, with agriculture coming in from the Middle East, near East, spreading across Europe. And then we have these Bronze Age Maya peoples coming from the Pontic Steppe into to Europe. They are pastoralists, right? And, and uh, the differences between Europeans are really mainly made up of how much ancestry do you have of each of these migrations. But, it's, you know, uh, for example, Northwestern Europe, we are mainly uh, Yamnaya Right, which is genetically Yamnaya, if you want. Uh, what, is mainly, Yam, what is Yamnaya? I've never heard. Yeah, that well, term. Yamnaya is a group of uh, pastoralists uh, that uh, are originating in the Pontic Steppe. It's uh, in the Caucasus area, and they're both spreading northwest and eastwards. Uh, you know, and and having a, in w- northwestern Europe having a massive influence. I mean, most likely they're bringing in. The languages we are talking today, what is called the Indo-European languages, that's British, German, uh, Danish, Swedish, etc. They are uh, contributing an enormous amount of DNA to us, right? So we we actually have very little left of the earlier migrations, right? And and, uh, also culturally, you know, the nuclear family is the most important entity in the group. Well, uh, it's, it's how we are today. Uh, they are bringing, it looks like they're bringing the genetic makeup that allow us to drink milk, uh, uh-huh, yeah. mm-hmm. break down milk sugar as adults, mm-hmm. which is very rare. Yeah, uh, It gives us a lot, you know, what you would call normally the North, the, the you can say the, the Northern European phenotype, very uh, light-skinned, uh, very tall. It's also Yamaya. So you can say... Uh, a lot of what us what makes us what we are today, if you want, uh, is is something is events that happened very late in our history, and for Western Asia and Central Asia, it's even later, right? So, so the world that we know of, if you want, mm, today, mm. and uh, that we sometimes hear, you know, is going very far back in time and stuff. For most cases. That's not that's not true, right? Yeah. I mean, and and it also means that we are uh, as humans, we are one big family, you know. And my own results have have changed um, my view on other peoples. I mean, because I grew up, as I said, uh, learning that we are actually quite different from each other, right? So when I saw somebody having a different cultural expression or different skin color, whatever, it was like, oh my God, this is a very different person. Today, I know. It's not right. I kind yeah. of look at them as saying, "Oh, that's a cousin," you know. So it really changed my own view, and and I think in that sense, uh, this ancient genetics have really contributed and will co- contribute to uh, changing our, the how we look at each other yeah. uh, as as way more similar than than uh, what we thought was the case before. Yeah. 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 Yeah, hopefully. I mean, that's, um, it's also interesting how, I mean, you know, we are so, we are so stupid, you know, sometimes as human beings that we're so attached to something that we have no control over for one, you know, how we're born, you know, the skin color or like you said, our phenotype. Yeah. No, I, you know, we have no control over that. Somehow we have so much, like, I mean, 
some people have so much pride in that and so much, you know, emotions around it. And I'm yeah. like, you had, you had no contribution I to mean, that. And plus it's so new, you know? It's yeah, so new. but I mean, you, I, I tell you, uh, I mean, I have been surprised uh, when we have been doing these studies, how much uh, many people put their identity into into mm -hmm. the past. Uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, uh, one thing is when we have worked with Native Americans, Aboriginal Australians, where there's really something uh, substantial and stake for them because it can be, you can say, access to land and resources, etc. Yeah. But but where I have where I have got my the, the strongest reaction is is actually in Scandinavia. You can say my home area where we had a part a study on on the Vikings, which is kind of you know a strong identity for Scandinavians, and we could see that that Vikings are not pure Scandinavians. I mean, you have Vikings that are mixed uh, you have vikings that have uh, no scandinavian ancestry but still viking so it's a lifestyle rather than a ethnicity oh. and i was shocked because i got a death threat i mean right wow. uh, so so it, it shows you uh, that that people put a lot of emphasis on this and and that brings us back to to uh, why i haven't done one of these um, ancestry tests right because yeah. i think it's wrong i think it's great to learn about our human history, I think it's uh, we, you know, it can also be useful because th those few differences that do exist can also be of importance in terms of our health or our susceptibility to certain diseases. So it's important to uncover it also for these reasons. But, but I mean, putting your identity yeah. uh, in 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 the deeper past is mm. is uh, doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, I mean, and we don't take our hair and our skin when we die with us. So, you know, like, no. is that, that is, a, it's a very weird attachment people have. But, um, so, I, I want, so, okay, so th this is like the, the main first question I want to ask you, like, to go on to get into this topic is I don't understand how we're still here. And my question is a little bit like the chicken or the egg, because mm. most of us know that if you take a human baby and you leave it on the floor, it's in the garden, in the desert, in the forest, it does it won't survive like it is mm -hmm. helpless in needs sure. and that's just like sure. most most mammals is the same so I, I, what i and i don't know if that's something that you can answer from i don't know if mm -hmm. that you can sort of have a an, a, a bit of an insight yeah. on from your background but like what mm -hmm. came first the yeah, inf the like the, yeah the infant or the parent and yeah. did we and how did we make it with that outside yeah. help? Like, is this yes. something that we know? Like, yeah. how on yeah. earth are we around? I mean, I think how you should look at this is it's not like uh, from one day to the next our species arrives, right? Right. I mean, this is a graduate process. So we, you know, if you imagine we go back some six, six to eight million years, there was nothing called a human, and there was nothing we could call a chimpanzee. We had a common ancestor, and then you know we are we are separated. You know some of these groups are separated from each other. Okay, you have a group which is neither human nor chimp, uh, but but they they are something in between. They are separated from each other, and one of these groups are then uh, slowly developing. Okay, into something different. And uh, this is kind of, you could say, the human lineage, if you want. And uh, from there, you know, different species. But it's all likely this is happening gradually. So it's not like you can say you're suddenly standing with a human baby uh, lying by itself somewhere, right? Yeah. I mean, you have, you have something that is, uh, you can say, uh, uh, taking care of that baby if you want. And, and, but then gradually due to both, uh, both selection, it means, you know, if the, if the suddenly, if you imagine the suddenly is a mutation, for example, that gives this benefit, this baby a benefit. Right? It can better, uh, you know, sustain uh, without water, for example, or something mm -hmm. like that, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, this baby, when it grows up, will actually be slightly more successful in getting kids that survives over all the other babies in this group, in, in this group, right? I mean, uh, that also becomes adults, but they're not getting just as many babies because 
they're living in this dry environment, you know, and uh, it's very hard but, for yeah, them to but, find water or whatever. But, Mm. But I, I, I sort of want to take it back a little bit because even mm. before, because I understand, you know, that's almost like the, I can't remember how there's a word for it, but, you know, it's like, it's that, that selection, genetic selection, the advantage that you get because, you know, you, and, mm. you know, and it's how it's sort of like we've sort of, I guess, survived, but um, to sort of adapt to different environments. But I, mm. I still don't understand because for that baby to then become an adult and have other babies, it was mm. a baby first. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm saying, yeah, I'm, yeah. And I'm going to but I don't understand uh, uh, how we've... True, how we've... True, true enough, but if you imagine, let's say, if you imagine you had something that was, I mean, slightly less important human, right, that are giving birth to a baby was slightly more human alike. Because there was a mutation that made it looking slightly more uh, modern human alike, right? And and there is some benefits. This baby that, I come, uh, that is now slightly more looking like us. It's not entirely us, but slightly more than the mother, right? And there is some benefits for this baby over the other babies that are not looking, mm-hmm. you can say, that are not looking slightly more like a modern human, right? So this baby is then getting... Kids uh, that survives because there's some benefits by being more modern human alike, and then they also get some mutations over time that makes them look slightly more human. So you 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 shouldn't see it as you know one day suddenly uh, you know a Neanderthal mother is standing with a modern human <laughs> baby oh, yeah, you know, in their yeah. arms. Do you see what I'm mm. saying? But I don't, so I, don't see, I don't see it that way. I'm not even thinking like even for example, even for the Neanderthal, I can't say the word, but Neanderthal well, mother. I would say the baby always, if you want, the egg, in my view, always have to come first, right? right. Because uh, if you understand what I'm saying, but it's not like, it it has to come first, but but it's not like it was born, you know. Some, one day, you know, you just had a modern human, right? It's a graduate process that something that is less modern human get a baby that is slightly modern human, more modern human, that are more successful than the others, that are then getting babies that also have some mutations that is make us slightly more human and so then it continues right yeah uh, you know and and there needs to be a benefit if you want a, a benefit of being slightly more human over uh, the other ones uh, and this is this seems to what is what happened right and that's why we look at, uh, and are the creatures we are today yeah, because it's, I mean, essentially, because you, you actually mentioned as well about how, you know, for example, with the chimps, we have like a common progenitor, if you like, or a common yeah. source, because that's one of the things that, you know, that apparently that's, that's very misunderstood with Darwin. I also just found out quite recently that obviously a lot of the concept, like what I believe for the longest time yeah, that Darwin yeah. had said was that we came from apes. Uh, not yeah. that we had a common progenitor. And for the longest no. time, I was like, well, hang on. How come are the apes still around? Because yeah, they're not yeah, extinct. Yeah. Like, how are we in parallel lives? But obviously, it's because we have, like, a, a kind of from a long time ago. Exactly. exactly. We had a common ancestor. So when people uh, sometimes say, you know, well, we derive from the chimps or something like that, that's actually not true, mm-hmm. right? I mean, what, 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 what happened is that uh, when you go millions of years back in time, we had a common ancestor. Right, that was neither chimp nor modern human. And what you should imagine is that the chimps have gone through a similar evolution, if you want, as as the humans. It's just different things that was favored, right? It was mm-hmm. different mutations that was favored, ending up with what we today know as a chimp. And it was different mutations that was favored that are leading up to what is today a modern human, okay? Yeah. And those two groups were separated, right? So at some point when they, when they, when when time goes by, you end at a time where they are so different from each other because there's been under different selection pressures that they no longer get kids together, right? Yeah, right, yeah. And then they have become 
if you want uh, yeah. two different species, right? Yeah, yeah. That's that's how you know when you're a different species is when you cannot cross breed, right? That's that's certainly one uh, yeah. one that's that's one definition. There's different yeah. de definitions, but that's the typical biological definition. Okay. To say when when you no longer uh, can get uh, children that can themselves get children together, well, then you are two different species. Because I think also like that's the thing that I mean, that's why you have to always to be so careful with information you see. Because I think the reason why that belief about us coming from the chimps has survived for so long and still is around is that mm. is that is that drawing uh, the march of progress or the road of Homo sapiens. Uh, where you see like the chimp and then you see the, the through all the different types yeah. of homos and then all of a sudden yeah. you're human. And yeah. that was way after, that was way later than Darwin. He was dead long time ago before that yeah, drawing yeah, came yeah, out. Yeah. So, you know, um, yeah. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of saying, I, I was like, well, that's what I thought as well. Yeah, so. but many people, I've heard this many, many times, <laughs> yeah, that yeah. kind of expression, right? And uh, so, so it's just uh, to kind of, Uh, see it as you know a common ancestor rather than you know we go from a chimp to become a human basically yeah. right uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah and so so because so you know with with all of the research that you've done and everything that you sort of exposed with um i wonder if you've ever had i don't know if that's if that has ever been a thought for you but because when i when i when i look around i feel like we're one of the only species well, probably like the only species on Earth that seems to be a bit like the weakest link in a biological sense because we are the one who have to compensate for, you know, with the weather. Like, you know, we have air conditioning, sun lotion, tools, clothes, and so on. And animals, they seem to be the one with the superpowers. You know, they can fly. They have natural super strength. They have super speed. They can breathe underwater. They can lit up in the dark. I mean, that's like a Marvel film, right? Mm, they can mm. live underwater and on land, some of them. Mm. Um, well, we're around with our, our clothes and, and air con and you know, tools that we need a plane. And so looking at that, like, don't we seem a little bit like the odd ones out? Like, in a, in a, <laughs> and I'm going to say like aliens with quotes, you know, like I just like the yeah. foreigners in, in that sense of being foreign because we don't really yeah. seem to fit in. And it seems almost like we've just arrived and gone... Ah, we kind of like it here. It's a nice planet. Let's just stay here and see what we can do with it. Because out of everything, like even what we just spoke about with like the chicken or the egg when it comes to human mm -hmm. babies, is that when you look at the manta ray, when it has, when it gives birth, that manta baby is off on its own. Yeah. Like and survives. But, yeah, no, I can see what, where, where you're coming from. But this is uh, what <laughs> makes us so successful, right? Is our brains. I mean, no other, you know, no other creature on Earth uh, has the ability, uh, you know, to think uh, the way that we are and to be creative in the sense that we can actually make clothes, right? We can create complex shelter. Uh, and uh, this has made us uh, tremendously successful beside, b b despite our weaknesses, right? Because we have been able to if you want to establish ourselves in all environments on Earth and even outside Earth, right? Yeah. No other creatures have been able to do this. And this is our, if you want, our creativity, our ability, our consciousness uh, that, that are superior, I would say. I would even use that word to other creatures. Then we are inferior in many other ways, right? I mean, we, as you say, we are not very strong. Uh, you know, we are not very fast. We're actually tremendously slow. But we are incredible in terms of being a among mammals, uh, in terms of being able to run over very, very long distances. So so mo other mammals, mm -hmm. uh, you know, are much faster than us. But over long distances, we can actually outcompete them. And this is why you see, for example, among uh, Khoisan in South Africa that They can run down game. Uh, they basically run it to death. Wow. So it's like a multi marathon you know. Right. And in the beginning, of course, the, the game is kilometers ahead of, of the human. But over time, you know, they're basically breaking down while the human can continue. And uh, so in that sense, we have like, uh, you know, when you look at all species uh, on Earth, right? There is some, uh, you can say, some uh, amazing things that they can do, 
Mm. Amazing capabilities. And then there's also some weaknesses, right? So you can, for example, some of some of it is due to uh, conflicts of interest, if you want, right? You can't be big and strong and at the same time small and can hide, right? It's the two things don't get along, right? right. So you have to uh, kind of either go one way or, or, or the other, right? Uh, so so uh, I would say uh, humans are unique in terms of our brain. I mean, it's 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 incredible and have made us uh, extremely successful. I mean, normally most uh, mammals, uh, and we are a mammal, uh, you know, are restri- have a much uh, more uh, restriction in terms of what kind of environment they can live in, right? Yeah. Even if you look, let's say, uh, at things like a reindeer or something like that, it's covering all the northern hemisphere on Earth. But you don't see it, you know, to the south, right? You don't see it in the tropics. Uh, well, there's deers there, yes, but it's a d- different species of deers than than uh, a reindeer. Humans are all over the place, right? We are in Antarctica, you know, uh, so and we are in the tropics. I mean, which is uh, because of this ability to, uh, you know, make clothes, make shelter, find new ways, etc. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I didn't, I didn't think of it um, necessarily that way. Um, and so, do in terms of a, a timeline when it comes to the human species, like how long yeah. have we actually been around now on Earth? What's yeah. the, what's the number that we have today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it depends a little bit on how you define the species, right? But but if you, if you say uh, what we traditionally call Homo sapiens sapiens, right? Yeah. Um, what we also, in other words, called anatomically modern humans. Well, then it seems like they are uh, starting appearing, uh, you know, with the characteristics uh, we know uh, from modern humans. We have a cheek, for example, right? We have a very tall forehead. Uh, and uh, they start appear around 500,000, about half a million years, maybe it's slightly wow. more, but uh, in Africa. And uh, from there, we are then spreading out of Africa. We It seems like we're making some attempts already, maybe uh, 120, maybe even slightly earlier, 150,000 years ago. But that doesn't seem to have been very successful to leave Africa. But then between 80 and 60,000 years ago, we, we, we have a successful uh, attempt. And and uh, those peoples that that get out of Africa at that time seems to be uh, the ancestors of everybody today outside Africa, whether you are in Asia, Australia, or Europe, yeah, or yeah. America. Yeah, it's quite it's quite a long time. I mean, it's definitely definitely a long time. Yep, yep. Um, I wanted to ask you something um, because. Uh, when you were on the podcast Flu Natale Agam, which is flying saucer mm-hmm. in, in English, sure. um, there was a mention about how how about um, sometimes you can have like a meteorite or meteor, yes. or a meteor yeah. that can hit Mars and then mm-hmm. a chunk of Mars, like a little rock comes out of Mars. And then if yep. everything aligns correctly, it can land onto Earth. And obviously that rock comes with bacteria. If it's, again, everything mm-hmm. aligns correctly and it can survive mm-hmm. uh, that long. Mm-hmm. So I was wondering if there was any anything around that maybe, because obviously bacteria is very, it's, 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 it's one of the major components of life. But I mean, without bacteria, I think we, I mean, we basically, we have tons of bacteria in mm-hmm. us, on us. We, we need it. Mm-hmm. Is there like any chance, and obviously I don't know how many chunks of uh, mass rocks have landed here, but mm-hmm. that somehow, whether it's in nature or whether it's in the plants that we eat, anything like that, there's some sort of hybrid may have happened? And mm-hmm. if so, can mm-hmm. we know that? Yeah. No, it's a, actually a very good question, uh, you know, uh, and it's something that is scientifically very debated, right? I mean, where do life originate from? Mm. I mean, does life originate on Earth? which is kind of a common belief, or could it be that life has originated uh, on another planet, let's say Mars, and then being transported to Earth? So when I was a university student back in the day, uh, people laughed about this later uh, and said, well, this is ridiculous. Nothing can uh, can survive a, a space travel, you know, uh, in a rock. But in fact, 
in a number of studies showing uh, this is not true. They can, some bacteria can survive this journey. Mm -hmm. And they're going into a dormant stage. And they can not only survive the journey, they seem also to be able to survive the impact when wow. the stone would kind of smash into earth, then they could survive. And the, given that we know there has been water on Mars in the past, and there's actually a lot of uh, stones, if you want, from Mars uh, landing on Earth, it's not out of the question that yeah. that uh, that life could have originated uh, from Mars, being transported to Earth, and then uh, kind of flourished on Earth as it died out on Mars. It is a possibility. Uh, I would say no one uh, at this stage, uh, I would say no one knows. Uh, no one knows whether it's the case. And you also ask, could there be some kind of hybrids uh, going on? And uh, I would say uh, uh, in terms of early life uh, on Earth, no one knows either. So so uh, I, it's, it's still one of the most, uh, I would say, intriguing and basic questions in, in science is how did life Originates. There's a, so just to give you an example of how diverse the views are, there's even people who have suggested that life on Earth is happening every day, right? New life, uh, I mean, is created from scratch, so to speak, yes. from inorganic particles. Right when we sit here speaking, you know, somewhere in my uh, in my carpet, you know, life is formed like dust mites and stuff. But, but the reason why we never see it is that that life on Earth is so well adapted that any new life trying to appear will be kind of exterminated immediately, right, for competition. So no one knows the bottom line, right? There is these different theories. This about from Mars, it's called panspermia. Um, that theory, others believe, no, no, no. You know, we only, uh, life is very unique. It originated on Earth only once, it diversified out. Others again say, no, no, it probably uh, happens all the time, but, but we just don't see it. So it's one of these cases, you know, where uh, a lot of theories, very little evidence. <laughs> yeah, but I guess it's also like until, I guess, until something is proven that it's that it that there's no way it can it, it can be true. It's always an area of exploration, right? I mean, that's exactly how science works, right? I mean, mm. people, uh, scientists, uh, comes up with many different ideas. They try to argue uh, for these ideas based on either theoretical grounds or maybe they have seen part things, some parts happening, but not the full picture, and they make up and say, well, maybe it could be like this. And then with time, you know, more experiments and more observations will be done. And in the end, uh, you know, you will come to some kind of conclusion of who was right, who was wrong. But science is never, it's important to remember, I mean, when you read in the, in the news uh, very often, it's kind of presented as the final, uh, you know, you put the kind of the final answer to a debate. Yeah. It's very rarely like that. I would say almost never. I mean, so the the discussions continues, and yes. and uh, and uh, I, I believe, of course, firmly believe that we are moving towards a better and better uh, understanding on on what is happening and why we are here and all these things. But but it's a journey, you can say, that uh, sometimes even get us in the wrong direction, and then you know you're bouncing back. And 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 suddenly embracing ideas that was otherwise believed to be wrong that suddenly turns out to maybe be true. So it is kind of a really rocky journey, uh, uh, and this is uh, this is how science works. And that also means that that many scientists, probably including myself, or also including myself, are sometimes wrong. I mean, we, yeah. We, yeah, yeah. we come up with and say, well, we think this is how it is. And then, you know, five years later, somebody comes with a new experiment or new result, and basically show, no, it was uh, true, you know, yeah. and then you are modifying. So this is how science works. Yeah, but I think that's that's kind of like the beauty and also the humility that I love about science is that, and, and scientists is that, you know, you, it's usually the more you know, the more you learn, the more you realize exactly. how little we know and the more questions it raises. And that's, 
And I guess it sort of makes sense that you kind of went into this kind of work because everything you just said now, all about the questions, it sort of really fits into a sense of adventure that you had, you know, when you were younger and when you found that research exactly. you could sort of have that freedom of going onto this adventure of like, the un the unbeaten path, uh, it really fits into your character and personality. So yeah, definitely, I think. Yeah, totally. I mean, mm -hmm. when I was young and went to Siberia, that was in the early nineties, right? I entered when it was still Soviet Union on the first expedition leaving uh, Russia. You know, the whole yeah. uh, the, the whole country uh, had had basically broken down, changed name. You know, at that time, you know, there was no good maps, right? We didn't know what to expect on, on the other side of, of the next mountain, if you want. But I would say research uh, and science is a greater adventure than even, you know, going yeah. to this kind of unexplored land, right? Because there's so many things we don't know, and there's so many things that we think we know, and then we, it turns out that we actually didn't know it. So it's one I, I think it's uh, and it's it's kind of a shame I think that it's not in, at least in some many universities and many schools are not coming forward as that right I was mm. so bored in, in school oh, with the yeah. science oh uh, God, yes, lesson same. right but in yeah. reality mm -hmm. I mean, it is an incredible adventure so when you are allowed to do experiments yourself and try to find out things yourself I mean it's a heaven uh, for for people who who want to to go on an adventure yeah no no absolutely it's just yeah i think it's just it's it's mind mind blowing um mm. all the things out there so so i guess yeah actually based on with what you just said now how can like we as as laymen you know when we're not scientists like how can we discern between mm -hmm you know, uh, proper conspiracies, you know, uh, yes, or yes. claims that have not been scientifically yes. proven yet, but yes. are open, you know, it's like we just haven't disproven sure. it yet. It's just a sure. conversation, whether we want to go down that road or not, is something different. But mm -hmm. so, or, so, so that the, the conspiracies or something that hasn't been proven yet, or uh, something that is so ahead of our time, yes. that we may yes. not be ready for them yet, right? So yes. how yes. can we sure. make that discernment? Like yeah, this. and I can see why people are, are, you know, are kind of struggling there, and yeah. they also sometimes are getting confused because this is also the case for myself when I'm not without my uh, my professional domain. If I kind of move outside that area, I also have uh, these troubles of distinguishing, right? But let me put it this way: I mean, all science is based kind of evidence so this is the this is the difference to uh, i would say um just pure conspiracy right uh, or or, or uh, fake fake news or whatever right i mean you can uh, so science before it's it's considered you can say a scientific uh, discovery or, or or scientific view, it has to be based on some kind of evidence. Then you can say the amount of evidence can vary, right? So if it's very credible and very well established, it's very often based on a lot of evidence, right? A lot of different types of evidence. And that means, you know, there's a lot high certainty if you want that uh, whatever is being said is, 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 is close to the truth, at least, right? Uh, but also, even in science, you can get, you know, statements that are based on very limited, much more limited evidence, right? And that means there's, a, 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 you can say, a high risk uh, that uh, whatever is being said is it might not be true, right? But 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 fake news, I mean, complete conspiracy or whatever is very often based on false evidence. It means evidence that are not real, right? Mm -hmm. Or no evidence at all. Claimed evidence that is not real, uh, well, if you're making it up, right? Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know. well, for example, when you saw, uh, you know, as an example, Trump's, Trump uh, saying, well, it was the greatest gathering ever. Like, 
for any president, and then people can look <laughs> and say, counting, yeah, yeah. Uh, counting yeah. individuals and say, no, yeah, that's yeah. actually not true, right? Yeah. So that's false evidence. That's right, false right, evidence, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, right? So, so, uh, so, uh, so, so, you need to, uh, you know, you need to, uh, I, and I know it's difficult. And yeah. one way, I think, one of probably the best way to to mitigate this problem at the moment is the sources, is I have to what? say. I mean, the source you are using. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, so some source are, are more credible than others, right? I mean, I, I know that uh, there's people who, who think, uh, who don't believe in the New York Times, for example, mm -hmm. right? But I would say I've been interviewed to the New York Times several times and uh, with our, and I would say it's, it's one of the most thorough um, uh, you can say newspapers, uh, news uh, 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 that you can be uh, that you can be interviewed by as uh, as a scientist, right? I mean, they are fact checking again and again. Whether it's correct or not, they are getting independent uh, statements from others, not only your friends but also actually yeah. some other people who are not your friends, etc. So, in general, I, it doesn't mean that there can't be mistakes or whatever. But but in general, it's a very credible source because they actually do a very uh, a lot of groundwork uh, to make sure that the information that they get is 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 covered mm -hmm. in, and correct and so forth. Right. While uh, as a scientist, I'm also very often interviewed by other media where, you know, when I read it afterwards, I'm like, what the hell? I didn't say that, or well, they misunderstood that, or whatever. Right. Yeah. So the source is. Is uh, extremely important when yeah. you uh, when you search for this information. But that said, I agree with you that where there there might be a a, a a problem, if you want, for science, even for science, is that sometimes scientists are coming out with with uh, you can say with stories, with views, etc. That by the scientific community as a broader scientific community is considered not credible. Mm -hmm. But then over time, maybe because it's based on very few little evidence, but over time, these guys can sometimes turn out to be correct, right? Do, I mean, do, we, have that's when, do, do we have an example? Yes, like, yes, yes, we, yes, I, okay. I, I do, right? I mean, wow. so, uh, for example, I worked uh, in an area uh, with uh, how uh, Scandinavia was, uh, uh, you know, populated, basically. I mean, Scandinavia was covered with ice during the last ice age. And the general notion was, you know, everything that was in Scandinavia before the ice, before it was covered with ice, died out, right? And it's first around 10, 11,000 years ago when the ice melts away, then it's migrating in, you know, from the south, and from the east that was ice free during the last ice age so all the plants and animals were coming in right and there was this guy swedish guy who found uh, tiny fragments of spruce uh, you know in in scandinavia at the time when it should have been completely covered with ice right and he dated them and got you know dates uh, going back you know 14000 15000 stuff like that where that where there should be nothing right? yeah He's publishing these things, and the broader scientific community thought he was crazy. They thought he was totally mad, saying, well, there is something that survived in here, he said, right? There's some trees that must have survived in here. And over time, you know, it actually turned out that most likely the guy's right, right? That there was open refugia in the ice, and in those open refugia, there was things surviving, and therefore the whole, uh, you can say, uh, uh, the whole, uh, you know, different trees and so forth in Scandinavia is really a mix of what was there originally and what was coming in. So it's yeah. it's a smaller story, but shows how, you know, a person that was really by the broader scientific community was considered false, most likely turned out to be right, right? So, so it's was a very he, was important... he alive? Was he alive when uh, when they? Oh, he was, he was. But when I think they realized... uh, I mean, it was really unpleasant for him for many years because he was kind of considered 
you the know, outcast, uh, yeah. really an outcast. Yeah. And and uh, it, it's a very important lesson because also as a scientist, right, because mm-hmm. even as a scientist, there's this tendency to to point your fingers. Another example is, uh, you know, the early peopling of the Americas, right? For until something like, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, the general notion was, well, the first humans that are in there as the so-called Clovis people, they're, they're coming in there around, uh, you know, south of the ice caps 12,000 years ago. And everything, everybody who said, well, maybe there's has been people there before were just smashed down, right? Mm. They were just totally, uh, you know, and they were made fun of in conferences. You know, they showed pictures of oh. the Yeti and oh. said, well, it's it's just as likely as mm. finding a Yeti that there was humans before. And now evidence have accumulated, right? Yeah. That, that, you know, there has been people before. So so you, you shouldn't point fingers. No. People who are coming with with other views, even though in the beginning, say uh, the the data is not super convincing. I mean, you need to keep an open mind, open mind right, yeah. as a scientist. It, it, yeah, and also it shows that, you know, scientists can throw shade quite well as well. You know, it's not just on social media, like the whole the Yeti thing. Uh, no, no, <laughs> so, exactly. I'm so shady. I'm, I'm really, I'm trying, uh, I'm really trying my best. I think this is one of the most important things as, as being a scientist is yeah. to keep an open mind, right? Yeah. So when, <laughs> when people say, for example, uh, you know, uh, could there be aliens? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I worked at some point uh, testing one of these alien theories. And, and, you know, I remember a Danish newspaper wrote a story about how I misused scientific money uh, oh, gosh, because yeah. I tested <laughs> something as ridiculous as this, right? And also mm-hmm. this skeleton, I didn't find, find evidence for it. But it's about keeping an open mind, right? Yeah. It's keeping an open mm-hmm. mind and saying, you know, with this alien thing, it, it was... a. Uh, uh, it was a theory that millions of people believe in uh, uh, across the world, right? Mm. Uh, that uh, it's a was guy it who's Sumer- died. With the yeah, the uh, Sumerians, right? Mm-hmm. It should be kind of uh, some of those uh, should be aliens, and and uh, and uh, you millions of people have read these books. They believe in those stories, and and so to test it important right because yeah. in my view it was important because you know obviously if it was correct it would change everything we yeah. thought we knew as scientists yeah. but also if it turned to be false uh, or we couldn't find evidence for it which was the case uh, you know that it had the potential at least to impact the mindset of millions of people right uh, uh, so uh, so but i got a yeah. lot of heat for for actually for, for doing this right but i think that's um, also not understanding that you know like you know if when people are giving heat for that it's also they're not understanding that actually part of science is is it's important to fail a lot no it's not even failing but you have to have things that are not a positive conclusion or whatever you have whatever the, the the word is but if you yeah. You, you cannot always do something and it'd be always successful like you're gonna have to no. try to never um and, and again it's 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 a bit of a, it's obviously it's a different sign, but like science, but like, for example, like with medicine, there's a lot of things that we can't explain, you know, how sometimes how people get ill and others don't, how people sure, die of it, how people sure. recover. So there are things that we cannot, there's, I think that's, that's why I think like, you know, I just, I love the, I love science and I love how mm-hmm. the mindset is. And I also love the things that we can't prove. I love, I love the ethereal, I love like looking into spirituality and, and what's sure. out there. And, and when you think about, because I think it, it could marry well together. Because sometimes you don't know where someone recovers from, you know, a, sure. yeah, terminal terminal disease. And I think the fact that you were saying earlier about, you know, oh, what we were talking about earlier with Mars and you know, has mm-hmm. life come from Mars? I find it's quite interesting how you know I think as a just as a human species, we've all nothing has really changed in the sense that we're always out there trying to look for the new frontier. You know, we've been nomadic mm-hmm. and. Uh, mm-hmm. We're looking for new things and then we're looking up to the sky and then we go out into space and we're now going yes. to Mars and with Elon Musk, mm. you know, going to Mars. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's a whole other conversation. But it's yeah. like, it, it, you know, there could be a bit of like, 
let's say, you know, 20, 30 years from now, let's say if something is said that, oh, maybe life came from Mars, it's interesting that we yeah. then went back home because in a way, I mean, yeah. I, I don't know what I think about Mars. It's not definitely not a place I want to go to because it looks like it's Earth in a few million <laughs> years. You know, it's like, yeah. it's actually like a really hard place to live, you know? Yeah, well, um, definitely. So I'm not, I'm not sure, you know. Um, yeah, that, that's no, but not... but it's 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 it, it. I think it's very important, you know, both to have the openness, but also to um, to appreciate, even as a scientist, that 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 you know, there's a lot we don't know. Yeah, I mean, and we can't explain. There's just tons of it we can't really explain. I would say, to the benefit of science, it's it's the best tool in my view we have to test whether, you know, it's like fake news, yeah. totally fake news, or whether we there might be something about this being mm -hmm. real and the truth, right? It's not perfect, by no means perfect, but it's the best tool we have. And this is how we should look at it. But that doesn't mean that science can explain everything. And, you know, science, uh, what science found out, uh, find out is only the truth and mm -hmm. nothing else is the truth. Because there's so much science can't explain at the moment. But you, you also have to remember that science in, in, in its form that we would call modern science or whatever, it's it's very young, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, we have had, you know, a, a few hundred years to to do this, right? And it's pretty incredible. If you think of it in that kind of context, it's actually very incredible what science have contributed with, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we can sit here talking to each other different parts of the world, seeing each yeah. other in, on on a screen, right? You can record what I'm saying, yeah. right? And afterwards, you can go out and you can drive home or whatever you're doing. I have light in my light bulb here, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, all this science, right? Yeah. So science has, I think, uh, more probably than anything else that, that humans have done, has transformed our way of life, right? Yeah. Absolutely. From and 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 that shows, in my view, the power of science. Even though, you know, it's not perfect. Even though, uh, you know, we change our minds, uh, you know, based on new data coming in, and it's always in progress. And all mm -hmm. these things. I mean, what it has created so far is uh, yeah. amazing. But but it is. I mean, the whole changing our minds. I mean, that to me, that is one of the quintessential things around freedom. Because for me, freedom is so like important, like freedom of choice. And I think the freedom to change your mind is important because, like, if you set your mind on something and you're so dogmatic about it, you're not, nah, this is it. This is where we are, and this is where we at. And something else come in, and you can't change your mind. I mean, you've created your own prison. You know, like. It, it's, it's good to be able to open yourself to, to other things. It's, it's super important. And I would say this is uh, what seems to be probably one of the most important things in terms of, you can say, socioeconomic success here in life, right? It is your ability uh, to, uh, to learn and adapt, right, mm -hmm. to new conditions, right? Think differently, you know, because the world, and this is what has driven evolution, Think about that, right? Why are we changing? Why are we becoming, uh, for example, a modern human when we started being, you know, an ancestor uh, of both uh, chimps and humans, right? How, how, what was, what, what was driving all this, right? That we ended to become who we are today. Well, it's because the environment around us is constantly changing. So that because when the environment is constantly changing, that is putting a pressure uncertain capabilities, right? And then, you know, so first it's uh, whatever dry, you know, after a few thousand years it become warm or it becomes hot or, you know, there's a massive outbreak of pathogens or whatever. And, uh, you know, we have to react on that. And all this has really, you can say, the surrounding environment is what is, uh, and the changing of surrounding environment is what's dri driving evolution. And this is really the same today. I mean, we, we, you know, it's 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 our ability to adapt. Uh, you can say with the changing conditions, right? And this is a, a thing that I also, at least myself, have been. I think is is, is something that is worth thinking about. Is when you then talk about, you know, who is who is the most successful person in or 
you know, you are in your classroom, for example, mm-hmm. right? And you say, oh, yeah, Linda, she's so uh, good at everything and she get the high marks in school and, you know, I don't really get as good marks, etc. right? I'm not really suited for this life. You have to remember two things, right? One is that we are product of our past. What is successful right now? Because the environment changed, right? The environment changed. So what is successful right now might not have been successful, you know, 500 years ago, 1,000 mm-hmm. years ago, or whatever, right? But the other thing to think about it is, well, we are, we can all be successful in, 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 in the right environment, right? right. So, so this is w- what I think is worth thinking about, right? That, that, you know, it's not like one genotype or one phenotype. I mean, one person, personality or way of being or whatever. It's just, oh, man, James just hit, you know, uh, the right spot, right? He was just the one, uh, you know, who's perfectly matched. I mean, we can, we can, what, what it's all about to be successful is finding the environment in which you, your personality, your genotype, phenotype is, will be a perfect match, right? So do you see what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's like, yeah, you have to have, if the environment doesn't match your personality, yeah, your exactly. Strength, you're not going to be exactly. successful. It, 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 it's no, like you're exactly. talking to the wrong room. You're performing to the wrong crowd. It's like you need to find the room it, exactly. where it's going to be a match. Well, yeah. Right. So if I take myself, right, I, I, as I said, you know, in 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 the, the early school years, I wasn't very successful. Why wasn't I very successful? Well, because the way I was taught wasn't fitted my uh, you can say my personality i mean right. i've done these tests afterwards i'm a global learner you know i'm not a sequential learner i have to understand you know everything have a kind of an overview before i can understand the details and i was taught you know as a sequential learner so it's maybe not very surprising that i uh, you know didn't do well right yeah. but then uh, you know uh, I later on, you know, I was in an environment where I actually had the ability to kind of get the overview before I went into the details, and then I really flourished, right? So it's about finding the right environment that fits you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah. Mm. I mean, that's why, like, you know, yeah, the school system, there's, there's, um, <laughs> yeah, there's, room, yeah. there's, room, there's room for change for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to... Um, ask you something about around DNA mm-hmm. because when when so for them when you look at the immune system I'm going to give two examples mm-hmm. so one mm-hmm. is the immune system mm-hmm. it does really look like this intelligence that surpasses anything that we could actually conceive or create right in a lab I mean it's so mm-hmm. advanced it almost looks like mm-hmm. an alien yes. like you know doing this, yes. all these yes, things yes. Sure. and then when you look at biochemistry it, you know when to me, like the questions it raises, like when you look at the inner world, so biochemistry, it feels like almost we have duplicated that on the outside world. So like a, like one example would be like how we leverage energy in our body, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. the way we do, for example, when we buy a house, we leverage a small amount of money compared to the house, let's say the deposit, to get a mortgage to buy a house. So mm-hmm. uh, my question is, do you believe that DNA has been dictating a way our lot? has been dictating a way of life in a much deeper and involved way than just how ticklish someone is, eye color, how prone to diabetes, diabetes they are. Mm-hmm. But is it possible that our DNA has actually mm-hmm. dictated our socioeconomic way of life? Because mm-hmm. all our answers are within. We've just mm-hmm. replicated it from, from yeah, the yeah, little I know yeah. anyway. No, this is, a, this is a good question, a very, um, you can say, politically charged question, right? And it's something that has been... Uh, been uh, is has been debated for more than 100 years and are still debated in science i mean basically how much is due to your you are you can say your dna if you want uh, how mu- i mean how much of you as a person is 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 bound uh, you can say to your dna and how much is environment i mean mm-hmm. by itself mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. um and uh, and uh, you know uh, the the you can say the beliefs have changed a lot over over the years, right? So if you go back to 
uh, in the beginning of the 1800s. Um, there was, uh, they didn't know what DNA were, but was, but they, they thought, you know, based on, among other things, Darwin's work, that everything were fixed, right? There was, in, the environment didn't really have any impact on you. You know, everything were fixed and and the, there was some really bad consequences of this. You know, you sterilized women, oh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, that didn't really fit uh, into society because they thought the, the argument was, well, you can't change anything anyways. Whatever you do for these, they will just you know, remain. And this was, uh, I mean, both in Germany and America and other places. Yeah. It also created a lot of racial uh, theory and, and things like that. Then, you know, when you move up to the 1970s, when I was a kid, uh, the, the notion was, oh, oh, genetics doesn't say anything, right? It's all environment. So the idea was you could take any person, put them into the right school or the right community, and they could all be, you know, whatever they wanted, right? Everybody... You were born as an empty box, so to mm -hmm. speak, and it's only what you fill in in this box. This is becoming who you are. I would say um, uh, the research that has been done over the years, and when you look at it, also the genetic research, definitely, in my view, suggests that uh, there's a lot that is, uh, you could say, uh, in, in terms of your capabilities that are determined by your genetics. That doesn't mean, however, that uh, environment doesn't have an influence because we know that also with very, I mean, for example, when you are in your mom's stomach as a fetus, right, uh, the environment in your mom's stomach will determine how your DNA code is expressed. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. So I'm an identical twin, for example. Me and my twin brother okay. have, uh, you know, the identical DNA strains, right? Yeah. But still, there's the, even though we look a lot alike, not very alike, there's still differences. There's also, uh, we don't look 100% identical, right? And so a lot of this is how our DNA is expressed, even though our DNA mm -hmm. code is the same, it's not expressed exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And this is due to, you know, differences in the, in the environment, in our mom's stomach, you know, he took more of the food, unfortunately. I got le le less. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. you know, so my body kind of said, well, you're getting out into a world where there's less food, right? Uh, and you're kind of prepared for that. We also know that the first early years, you know, from zero to two to three years, are extremely important for in terms of how you are nursed, mm -hmm. uh, for 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 uh, determining, you, you know, your abilities to feel, for example. Yeah. Right. So there's this very uh, uh, this terrible observation just after after Second World War where there was a lot of orphans, orphan babies in, mm. in Britain, uh, you know, that was on these, uh, you know, taken care of because their parents had been killed. And they were lying in these huge rooms, right? Mm. And the people uh, started observing that those that were close to the door became normal, while the other ones kind of developed, uh, you can say, abnormalities in terms of uh, what they can feel and, mm. uh, and stuff like that. And this was simply because the nurse, when she looked for whether they were asleep or just went into those close closest, mm -hmm. right, and kind of just shaped them a little bit, no, little Joey, uh, you're doing yeah. well, right? So, so, uh, so it's not. I mean, both uh, seems to play a major role. But I would say that, in my view, uh, recent research, in my view, but this is my personal mm -hmm. view, have shown. That, uh, that your genetic profile are, are much more determining who you are than what I learned in school, for sure, yeah. right? And that's why I'm saying it's also about finding the, the right environment for you yeah. because that genetic profile can then be, uh, I, if you want, a major benefit in some settings, but not so much in other settings. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's also what you do with it, right? So, for example, this is why, one of the reasons why I don't like... My question was a bit... I'm going to go back to the question because uh, I was sort of asking on a different different level. But, like, okay. the, for example, one of the reasons why I don't do 23andMe or don't like 23andMe is, is because... Or not necessarily that company. I mean, now I think, I yeah. don't know, maybe if they've changed a lot, but people would get a result and they go, oh, my God, I'm... 
X amount likely. First of all, they don't understand the statistics. You know, they don't explain no, them. They don't. No. So they, they, a lot, there's a lot to unpack there. But the other reason is that, you know, yeah, you may be prone to diabetes, but guess what? If someone has not, no genetic um, this um, disposition for yeah. become diabetes, yeah. but then they learn they eat like five cakes a day and yeah. sedentary, yeah. they, they don't they don't move yeah. and so on and so forth. They're more likely to have diabetes than if you are just leading a healthy life, you know. So exactly. I think there's a lot exactly. of like you know it, it's very much out of context those those kind of DNA. No, no, but I I agree with but, you. I mean, most most of these uh, you can say most of what the DNA can s tell you something about is you know, a susceptibility to something, right? Exactly, yeah. It, it means, uh, it means uh, you might have a higher risk of yeah. diabetes, but if you lead, live a reasonable, healthy life, right? I mean, your chances of diabetes is still lower yeah. than one with a lower susceptibility to, to diabetes, as you say, that are eating cakes uh, day in day yeah, and yeah. day out, right? I mean, so, so, so one has to be, and, uh, you know, uh, you have, have to be very careful about how you yeah. interpret uh, this type of data. There is a few instances where it can be extremely useful, right? Where, yeah. for example, there's a certain risk of breast cancer where mm -hmm. you can say uh, one mutation make a very high risk, right? And by actually uh, taking care of it, uh, up front, go and get, you really get uh, decreases time, your yeah. risk of getting it, right? Yeah. But most diseases are not like that. Yeah. So, yeah. But, but my, my question was more in a sense of like, you know, that the socioeconomic way of life in the sense that because when 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 you look at how our body functions, like, you know, on, on a biochemical level, it reminds me a lot of how we live in society, how how everything functions, you know, how mm -hmm. and the same thing, like, yeah. with the, that, you know, the example of the energy, um, how we leverage energy in our body for certain mm -hmm. functions. We do the same in life, you know, like we, most of us don't have, you know, 1.5 million for a house. So we get a deposit and then, yeah. you know, we get a big mortgage, you know, <laughs> yeah. for the next 50 years or so. Um, yeah. And so it's, there's a lot of like the bartering that we do and there's, and also even if you just look into the body, um, mm -hmm. it looks very much like earth. You know, if you look at, you know, if you had to look at microscope and look at, you know, the intestines and different things, it's like valleys and mountains and rivers and, there's a lot of things that remind a lot of uh, not just our environment, but also how we how we function. And I think that's where sort of my question came from. It's like I wonder if maybe on an unconscious level, on mm -hmm. DNA, um, because the DNA kind of looks like a computer code, you know, the way they represent. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's sure. actually how it really looks like the DNA, yeah. the way they they do it. But it, it, in a way, it looks like this coding, like a program, and that. I wonder if like that sort of kind of maybe on an unconscious level has helped us survive for so long and created society and, and we then created like, you know, um, a way of life how we can sustain ourselves and then we've sure, you know, now capitalism. Sure. But yeah, that's sort of on that level. Yeah, you know? I mean, I think you're right that it, it it is kind of a computer code. It's just an extremely complex computer code because one thing is just reading the sequence you know with the four letters and and you know saying well you know it's the order of these four letters and we have the three billion of them as a human right so there's many different variations you can put those four letters in but then the structural you know how the dna is folded up for example right that adds uh, complexity but i i would say i mean it's like a, a incredible advanced code and and when we make, um, you know, uh, when we make uh, a lot of, of, of human-made things like medicine, etc., of course, we are in, in many ways copying uh, things that uh, to, on a much more simple level, uh, which are already, you can say, part of the biology and how biology and how the world works, if you want, right? And uh, it's just that our capacity to understand uh, the complexity is not uh, developed enough, right? So, so everything we are doing as humans, whether it's medical or whether we are, you know, trying to build something or whatever it is, I mean, we are, we are to a large extent uh, using information that are already existing in nature, but just but we are we are applying it on a more simple level because we can't really replicate uh, you can say uh, mm -hmm. the the real complexity right in a 
in, uh, in you know in, in what we see in, yeah. in 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 the real world, right? And uh, of course, uh, as science progress, we are able to do it more and more complex. We believe, and I think it's true, but <laughs> we are far away. And this is because. If you take something, you mentioned yourself, the immune system, right? Mm. I mean, it's super advanced. It's mm -hmm. super complex. And it's because, you know, we have been bombarded during our evolution. We have been bombarded with pathogens, bacteria, viruses, fungi, uh, parasites, you name it, right? And, it, and we can just see when we go and sequence these genomes of back in time, we can just see how... You know, it has just been a bombardment, right? And therefore, we have evolution over time have really tried in all levels to cope with this, right? Yeah. And makes us resistant uh, toward this. And it has developed into something so advanced and so complex that even though we believe you understand, you know, the basic parts of it, I mean, the details, yeah. uh, we cannot, right? And if you are trying to, it, with science, you know, exactly how will something move across space or across time we can do it with increasing precision but it's there's always uncertainty right there's always some degree of uncertainty because there's small things we don't understand right yeah do you and see what i'm saying things, that, things, that things we cannot anticipate change. right there's like variables that we cannot anticipate there's variables we I don't mean, yeah. really understand yeah. and can't you know, fit into mm -hmm. our models, right? Even though I think they're incredible, these models, you know, it's it, there's details that we just don't have a handle on yeah. uh, uh, still, right? And uh, so, so nature is, if you want, even though we are inspired from it, we, we, we understand, we understand principles that we are then can apply, you know, into our human shaped world, if you want, uh, you know, nature is so complex that uh, our brains at the moment, uh, our capabilities cannot match it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I think, yeah. yeah. I, it, but in a way, it's not so bad because, I mean, yeah, life is, um, I think life, it's okay that life stays kind of a bit of a mystery and precious. Yeah, 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 and there's still work for science to be done, which is great. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. Yeah. Um, so, ask. I want to ask you the the finishing thoughts that I ask all of my guests um, before we say goodbye. The first one is, um, you know, what life lessons do you wish you learned sooner? It doesn't have to be with, to do with DNA. It's just, it's just general. Like, what life lessons do you wish you learned sooner? That I wished I learned sooner. Okay. Well, I think... Uh, there's two things really. One of them we already touched upon is about uh, instead of seeing yourself uh, as a failure because you don't do well in school or whatever, uh, like like I didn't do, uh, to to uh, acknowledge and get, get a grip that every personality, basically, right, every human being, by finding the right match you can prosper and I think uh, I want to give that lesson because I was suffering myself a lot with this about oh I don't get good marks and and still here I am right uh, principal yeah. professor in Cambridge right so it's a matter of, of, of finding the right path for you for whatever you want to do and that means finding that environment that that fits you okay so I think that's one lesson I would have liked to learn earlier yeah. Uh, in 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 life. The other thing that at least for me has been very beneficial, and I want to pass on, which relate to this, is to set yourself long term goals, right? Because um, you know it doesn't mean that your goals can't change along the way. It's totally fine that you modify them. That you become wiser. You get uh, new interest. You get new input, and you modify modify your goals but but the, the the good thing i think about having long-term goals i and i have i think really benefited from from doing this is that it gives you some direction in life so it means that you you uh, when you get opportunities and we will get tons of different opportunities right you can go out drinking beers with your friends or you can sit down studying for example or 
you get this offer to go on this uh, expedition to somewhere or whatever, or you get an uh, opportunity to go to an, uh, on an expedition somewhere else, and you have to choose, right? And uh, to make those choices, I have found personally extremely valuable to, ha- to have these, to set yourself some long-term goals that you then can adjust along the way. Because it means that when you take your choices, it's kind of pointing you towards Mm -hmm. a direction where you want to be. So I would say those are probably my two uh, contributions to to, uh, at least try to be successful and be happy with who, who you are. Yeah, no, I like that. I like that. And it's just, it's like you say, like with the goal, it can change. But it's like you probably, I mean, you've probably you've probably heard this before. But it's like that thing where, like you know, if you go on a boat and you don't know where you're sailing to, well, you're just gonna go adrift wherever you know and, and land somewhere. But when you're in a boat, you you know where you're going. You know, let's say you, you're going to Spain, but you, the journey towards there may be quite rocky, wavy, a storm or exactly. sunshine and flat. You don't know. You may take a detour. Fine, but at least you know where you're going. Otherwise, you just end up exactly, in the exactly. triangle. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then I would say, uh, re- related to that, uh, I guess a third advice would be to remember that all success in life, whether you are uh, you know, doing radio, whether you are a scientist, whether you are whatever, you know, body experience a lot of bumps along the way uh, yeah i mean and and uh, people shouldn't uh, you know it's just how it is yeah and uh, you know to to enjoy when you when you achieve something whatever it is you know uh, i would say the good news is that the more bumps you have uh, faced along the way the the greater is it to get there in the end yeah. I mean, you can't have happiness without sadness, right? You can't have a success without failure. And everybody uh, who uh, believe and uh, looked at as being successful have had a lot of failures along the way. And this is how you learn. Yeah. What, what makes the difference uh, among people is not the amount of failures. It's whether they are learning from the failures, right? Yeah. And failures, you learn from failures. You know, yeah. so if you process them co- properly and say, well, yes, it was a failure, but what can I do the next time to avoid this or yeah. get around this or whatever you have learned? And in the end of the day, you will be in a much stronger position yeah. than people that didn't experience those failures. And that's something also to remember. I think. Yeah, it's making that failure worthwhile. Otherwise, it's just a waste of time that you can exactly. turn into an experience. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And the, the second question I ask all my guests is, what stuff do you not put up with anymore? What, do, what, sorry, what? What, <laughs> what you, stuff? Uh, what's, what's stop, you not, okay. Yeah, what stuff? What do you not put up with anymore? Oh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, well, say that uh, becoming older, I, I, you know, I'm not spending time on people that I don't really like, <laughs> or, or find yeah, some kind of, or, or find some kind of joy being together with. I mean, so for me, when I was younger, you know, I worked with many, many different people, and sometimes, you know, it was really people I didn't like too much, and and you're doing it because you think, well, okay, it's needed. But I, I think I, I'm in a privileged situation now uh, that I can actually choose not only people that I think are interesting and good to uh, good scientifically, for example, to work with that can contribute something scientifically, but I can also choose to say, well, if I, I really think this person is an asshole, well, I don't want to work with that person. And this is a great relief. <laughs> yeah well yeah oh, absolutely yeah i mean life is too yeah. short to be yeah absolutely. yeah exactly absolutely yeah Eske, it's been such an honor to have you on really like it's been i've really really enjoyed it and just before i ask where people can find you and buy your books and so on is there anything else that you'd like to share is there anything maybe i didn't you didn't I, maybe i interrupted you or you didn't get a chance to say um no, I think it's good. We, uh, we, uh, we, you know, came around many uh, interesting topics and, and discussions. So that's great. Okay. Well, so, well, I mean, yeah, for me, it's been brilliant. I'm 
Um, Essie, can you please tell us like, um, where can people find you? Um, how can they find out a bit more about your work, buy your books, and so on? Pl plug all yeah. stuff. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, I can say that that um, I mean, you can always just Google my name, Eski Willerslip, uh, and uh, you know, my contact details will pop up either for Cambridge or Copenhagen University uh, email, phone, etc. Uh, and uh, then, you know, I'm, um, in terms of books, I can say, well, you know, there's books you can buy in the bookstore, but I'm actually coming out. I just uh, did a children's book that is coming out now. And in June, I'll have a new book, which I really like. Actually, I, I think it's the best one I ever did. Um, okay. What is it that is coming out in June. Uh, it's called, it's a fucking adventure in English. <laughs> it's fucking adventure, but... Yeah. It's about, you know, uh, it's about science, it's about adventures, it's about expeditions, it's about meeting different cultures around the world. And and I really like it. I, I think it's it's a, a super nice book. And uh, yeah, so it's out there. It's unfortunate it's only in Danish so far, but they are working on seeing if they can make it into English. So maybe that will happen too. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, uh, Eske. I'm looking forward to your next book and thank you so much for taking part. Yeah, my pleasure. And that's our episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Please don't forget to rate, review, share it, subscribe it on iTunes, follow it on Spotify or whichever platform you listen from. However you show love is how you can support this show. Drop me your questions or suggestions for future episodes via the website at angie-s.com or come and find me on Instagram at tool for this shit podcast. See you next week and until then. Using health inappropriately.